Early 20th century America must have been a crazy time to be alive. It was an era marked by prohibition, the mob, two world wars, an economic boom, the great depression. It was a time in which trust was seen as both a virtue and a weakness, which was great news for the subject of today's video and possibly the most infamous con artist of all time, Victor Lustig. Prepare to be amazed as we delve into the life and exploits of a man whose cunning and charisma rewrote the rules of deception. From his audacious schemes that included selling the Eiffel Tower, not once but twice, to his con that tricked a notorious mobster and the scam that ultimately led to his arrest and a lengthy sentence behind bars at Alcatraz, Victor Lustig was a man whose trickery knew no bounds. He was the king of con men, the god of grifters, and to this day he is still associated with the Ten Commandments for con men. So grab a seat, check your pockets, and get ready to be taken for a ride as we recount the incredibly true tale of one of history's master manipulators. Much of what is known about Victor Lustig's early years comes from prison interviews with the man himself, although it goes without saying that some of his claims could very well be false. Supposedly, he was born on January 4th, 1890, in the Austria-Hungarian town of Hostene, which is now a part of the Czech Republic. At one stage, he boasted that his father was mayor of the town, while at other times he described his parents as the, quote, poorest peasant people, and said he grew up in a grim house made of stone. The latter seems to be the most likely version, as it would explain his need to steal from an early age to survive, although ironically, he maintained that he only stole from the greedy and dishonest. Accounts published in true crime articles paint an upbringing in which Lustig evolved from panhandler to pickpocket to burglar to street hustler. True Detective Mysteries magazine once wrote how he had mastered card tricks by quote, palming, slipping cards from the deck, dealing from the bottom, and such. Apparently, as a young adult, he could make a deck of cards do everything but talk. But his evolution didn't stop at cards. Upon completing his studies in Paris, Lustig soon began targeting wealthy travellers sailing on ocean liners between France and New York. Among his elaborate ploys, one standout scheme involved masquerading as a musical producer eagerly seeking investments for a bogus Broadway production. However, when the outbreak of World War I led to transatlantic services being suspended, Lustig found himself at a crossroads. He was already attracting heat from the authorities, and stood out because of a distinctive two and a half inch gash along his left cheekbone, a memento he received from a love rival in Paris where he liked to gamble. So, Lustig made the decision to move to the land of opportunity, the United States, on a permanent basis. Not long after his arrival, Victor had started making a name for himself stateside too. Detectives in as many as 40 different cities had begun referring to him as the Scarred, and had heard tale of his scams, such as the one in 1922 when he manipulated a bank into parting with funds in exchange for bonds tied to a repossessed property. Employing his deft sleight of hand, Lustig performed an astonishing disappearing act, vanishing not only with the money, but also with the bonds in tow. Despite his antics, Lustig was not seen so much as a threat, but as a quote, smoothie. He was only 5 foot 7 after all. He weighed 140 pounds, had never held a gun, and enjoyed collecting butterflies. How dangerous could he be? One of Lustig's most fruitful endeavours was a scam known as the Romanian Money Box. It involved an ingeniously crafted cedar wooden box adorned with intricate brass dials and rollers. Lustig would present the box to a potential victim, or mark, and claim that it possessed an uncanny ability to replicate banknotes using the power of radium. The spectacle was often elevated by the presence of his accomplice, an enigmatic sidekick named Dapper Dan Collins, who was described by the New York Times as a former circus lion tamer and death-defying bicycle rider. To convince the mark that the box was genuine, Lustig would urge the unsuspecting target to provide a specific bill denomination, say $100. He would then place this bill alongside a blank piece of paper within the contraption before engaging the mark in a curious waiting game. The pivotal moment arrived when a duplicate bill would suddenly appear within the device, much to the mark's amazement. 
To prove that the new note was real, Lustig would then accompany the mark to a bank where the second note would be verified. In truth, it was another sleight of hand trick. Concealed within the device was an authentic banknote chosen in advance based on the bill the mark had supplied. Once the mark was convinced of the box's magical abilities, Lustig would charge them a substantial sum for it. Before parting with it, he would quickly insert additional legitimate banknotes into the box, buying him crucial time to make his escape before the mark grew suspicious. By the time a victim uncovered the deception, Lustig would be long gone. Lustig's bag of tricks extended far beyond the Romanian box. His schemes encompassed fake horse races, feigning seizures during business deals, and elaborate but entirely fictitious real estate investments. These exploits propelled him into the dual role of a public enemy and an affluent millionaire. Always on the move, Victor returned to Paris in 1925, where he undertook his most outrageous con yet. After reading in a newspaper that the Eiffel Tower had fallen into disrepair, and that public sentiment could well cause it to be removed, inspiration struck. He soon set about acquiring stationery adorned with the authentic seal of the French government, and positioned himself at the reception desk of the opulent Hotel de Crillon. Under the guise of a government representative, Lustig proceeded to craft persuasive letters to prominent scrap metal dealers, inviting them for a rendezvous. When the marks inevitably came, Lustig sat them down in a quiet room and announced, quote, because of engineering faults, costly repairs and political problems I cannot discuss, the tearing down of the Eiffel Tower has become mandatory. He then informed them the tower would be sold to the highest bidder. It was Andrew Poisson, an insecure Parisian businessman who became the mark. He paid Lustig a bribe of 70,000 francs to secure the tower. Of course, Lustig fled immediately and went back to Austria to hide out. He had correctly assumed that Poisson would be too embarrassed to report being conned to the police though, and when there was no report of the crime in French newspapers, Lustig returned to Paris to repeat the exact same scam. He again managed to find a mark, but this time the police were informed, so Lustig scurried back to the United States. While it may seem ridiculous nowadays, such schemes were prevalent in America during the 1920s. Charismatic immigrants like Charles Ponzi, whose name would come to define the notorious Ponzi scheme, defined a period when European con artists held sway. These cunning con men favoured charm above brute force. They referred to their targets as marks, not suckers, they were respectful to women, and abided by a code. Perhaps that's why Lustig decided to pull one over on one of America's most notorious gangsters. When the throes of the Great Depression gripped the US between 1929 and 1939, Lustig devised a daring scheme targeted at none other than Al Capone. Fully aware that discovery would lead to his certain demise, Lustig's plan diverged from his typical straightforward cons. Cunningly, Lustig proposed an investment opportunity, enticing Capone to pour $50,000 into an unknown but dubious venture. Lustig then safeguarded the funds in a secure deposit box for two months before returning to Capone, admitting that the project had fallen through. This artful manoeuvre gave Lustig an aura of authenticity, causing Al Capone to believe that he was dealing with an honest man. Upon gaining Capone's trust, Lustig then told Capone of his own financial ruin due to the failure of the venture. And, just as Lustig had hoped, Capone took pity on him and gave him $5,000, or $1,000 according to some sources, as a means of temporary assistance. It was a risky play for sure, but Victor Lustig was the best of the best. It's said that he took great pride in recalling his illicit triumphs during his heyday. In addition to some wild anecdotes that no doubt entertained his fellow fraudsters, he also left behind a guideline of sorts for aspiring con men of the future to follow. Essentially, it was a list of do's and don'ts that became known as the Ten Commandments for Con Men, and it's still being circulated to this day. The commandments are as follows. 1. Be a patient listener. 
It is this, not fast talking, that gets a con man his coups. 2. Never look bored. 3. Wait for the other person to reveal any political opinions, then agree with them. 4. Let the other person reveal religious views, then have the same ones. 5. Hint at sex talk, but don't follow it up unless the other fellow shows a strong interest. 6. Never discuss illness, unless some special concern is shown. 7. Never pry into a person's personal circumstances, they'll tell you all eventually. 8. Never boast. Just let your importance be quietly obvious. 9. Never be untidy. 10. Never get drunk. So, there you go. If you've ever wanted to be a successful con man, you now have the rules you need to follow. Although, obviously, we don't recommend actually carrying out this line of work unless you like prison food. Like many con men, Lustig's problem was that he didn't know when to quit. In 1930, he entered a partnership with two men from Nebraska, pharmacist William Watts and chemist Tom Shaw, and set about producing counterfeit money on a massive scale. Watts and Shaw etched the plates used to generate counterfeit dollar bills, whereas Lustig orchestrated a network of discreet couriers. Soon, Thousands of dollars of so-called Lustig money was finding its way into circulation on a monthly basis. Eventually, federal agents began to take notice and were spurred into action by the escalating influx of fraudulent currency. Authorities were also notified of the illegal activity by Lustig's mistress, Billy May, who sold him out when she discovered that he was having an affair with a younger woman. It was on the 10th of May 1935 that the wheels of justice caught up with Victor Lustig, as he was apprehended in New York and charged with the crime of counterfeiting. While Lustig readily admitted to the involvement of his accomplices in the counterfeiting operation, he portrayed himself as ignorant of the intricate details. Nevertheless, his fate took a decisive turn when he refused to divulge information regarding a mysterious key found in his possession. This key would later lead to a locker at the Times Square subway station, revealing a treasure trove of incriminating evidence, including a staggering $51,000 in counterfeit bills and the very plates responsible for their production. The day before his trial, Lustig executed a daring escape from the Federal House of Detention in New York City. Feigning illness, he used a rope he had crafted to scale the building and run to freedom. However, the triumph of his escape was short-lived, as he was recaptured in Pittsburgh just 27 days later. In court, Lustig opted for a guilty plea, ultimately receiving a 15-year prison sentence on Alcatraz Island, plus an additional 5 years for his month-long jailbreak. Lustig's life concluded in a sombre fashion. Stricken with pneumonia, he succumbed on the 11th of March 1947 at the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. His death certificate listed his occupation as an apprentice salesman, in stark contrast to the elaborate schemes that had once defined his life. It's interesting to note how Victor Lustig was able to make the most of the time period he lived in and to take advantage of people's naivety including Al Capone and the police. One would hope that he wouldn't be able to get away with the same type of scams today, but no doubt if he were still alive, he'd soon come up with other ways to swindle people out of their cash. While it's hard not to respect the hustle of old-time crooks like Lustig, it's a shame that he didn't get to use his intellectual powers for good. He did, however, make it into the Fraudsters Hall of Fame, where he will likely stay until the end of time unless he figures out a way to cheat death too. <laughs>